Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Friday. Uh, thank you for joining. My name is Anan Hanna. I'm one of the SE here at uh, Securematics, and uh, uh, we are here to discuss uh, uh, routing and switching and how to tie them with the uh, AI-driven campus. Uh, so I have asked, actually, our sales team and about their suggestion of what to uh, what they want to discuss what they want to uh, uh, their uh, customers or partners need and the switching and routing came as uh, one of the uh, most common answers uh, no uh, this is not a strange thing because actually switching and routing is our bread and butter. We do it every day here at uh, Securematics. Uh, so uh, in case of uh, you wanted to hear about switching, their features, their licenses, same thing with the routers, their features, the high availability, how AI is driven uh, to these solutions. Uh, we're going to discuss it uh, here uh, along with uh, Bill Kine from uh, uh, Juniper. But before I hand it out, I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of services that my uh, engineering department do here at Securematics. So uh, you will have a dedicated uh, SE uh, dedicated to your account. I'm one of them based here in San Diego along with uh, Keegan Wade uh, and uh, we have another SE based in uh, South Carolina whose uh, his name is Brian and he just uh, recently joined Securematics. Uh, so you will have uh, one of us dedicated to your account. We can definitely help with answering your questions, uh, helping with the design, with creating bill of material, jumping on calls with, uh, with your end users in case needed, uh, escalate any issues you have with the Juniper team if we weren't able to uh, solve that issue for you. So uh, uh, please utilize us. Uh, we can as well help you with not only with Juniper but with uh, missed missed product missed solution like the proximity tracing. Uh, we actually created a showcase for the proximity tracing here in our uh, headquarters in San Diego, and we wish that uh, when the, uh, everything back to nor is back to normal, we can do some uh, uh, side visits to show you the uh, our uh, back to office plan and how secure how uh, proximity tracing worked uh, greatly to uh, keep everybody secure when uh, when we back to the uh, office. Uh, the other feature that we our my department have or the other service that my department have is the live demo pool. We have a very uh, refreshed and large demo pool, uh, very easy to access through our website. Uh, you can uh, absolutely go to our website and ask for a, select the uh, demo unit that you want, any model, uh, and we can ship it usually uh, same day, if not, then uh, the second day. Uh, our uh, units are uh, very new, so and they are from the access switches up to the uh, top of the rack, high-end switches of QFXs, uh, some of the uh, access points for MISTs that support Wi-Fi 6, access point that support BLEs, uh, so uh, please fr feel free as well to utilize the, the, our uh, demo units uh, professional services other uh, service that we do uh, to help our uh, partners and uh, have them uh, uh, get into uh, like uh, uh, closing deals like uh, license activation adding uh, uh, models or power supplies or uh, anything to your order we can do it here before we ship it to you so uh, that would help as well in, in closing deals uh, the other thing i think the last thing is i want to mention is that uh, helping you with the uh, training uh, for the uh, for the juniper uh, certificate so we can guide you through trainings we can help as well with uh, uh, vouchers or uh, uh, training sessions with Juniper with the help of our marketing department. So please feel free to utilize uh, us, contact us, me or uh, any one of my uh, team members. Uh, we are here uh, really willing to assist you with uh, your uh, Juniper journey.
I think I covered what uh, the services that I wanted to mention, and I want to hand it out to Bill Kine now to go further and explore the switching and routing and how AI is uh, uh, campus is tiered to to the to this solution. Bill. Okay, great. Thanks, Anand. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Kine. I'm an SC manager with Juniper, uh, based out in Southern California. Um, I cannot see the chat window from my screen, but feel free to type in questions um, or even uh, even ask them on your microphone too. And uh, Bailey will be watching the chat, and she'll uh, she'll kind of tug on my sleeve uh, virtually if uh, there's anything that we want to cover real time. Um, Anon is absolutely correct. The the topic of the day is really the switching and routing solutions. But rather than telling you how many gigabit ports there are on an uh, EX4300, I wanted to kind of tie this together into a campus area solution. So that, of course, includes switching and routing. In fact, they're very integral to that. But it also includes a management and um, the user experience and so forth. So from a high level, I want to talk about the big picture, and then we can drill down to as much detail as you guys want. The biggest message that I have for all of you folks is just like Anon said, uh, we're here to help. If you're looking at refreshing your network, if you have a, um, a new project or a new, new um, building or campus or something like that in the works, please contact Juniper, contact Securematics. We're all here to help you out with that. And, you know, worst case, perhaps you'll learn a little more about some of the things that, that uh, uh, another vendor can offer. So the agenda that I have is, first of all, talking about the AI-driven enterprise. Um, that's a little bit of a um, repeat of what we covered last month, but that'll be at a very quick pace too. So it's more of a refresher or a reminder, if you will. Tied into that is really one of Juniper's mantras for 2020, which is engineering simplicity. So we make very um, sophisticated project products with lots and lots of features. In fact, so much so that it tends to overwhelm people at times. So our focus also is on simplifying the user interface, the user experience, and the configuration and management of all of these tools. Um, if you go back to uh, probably the best example in our industry, I hope we don't have anyone from Target stores online because I'm gonna uh, use them in slightly negative way there. If you remember when they were attacked, when they had security breaches, they actually had all of the tools at hand to prevent that. But the tools were a bit overwhelming to them and uh, they didn't take the time to learn how to deploy those properly. So therefore, they ended up paying a bit of a price. From a Juniper standpoint, engineering simplicity is just about that. We're gonna give you a lot of features and a lot of things that you can customize but you need to also be able to do that in a way that where you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Uh, from there, we'll talk about the campus solution and then a quick wrap up. So first, a real quick introduction to Juniper. So silly questions. Um, I often start a lot of presentations, although uh, they tend to be in, in, per, in person along these lines. I ask people um, and feel free to think about the answers yourself. Um, here it is almost uh, midday on the West Coast. And did any of you folks use Facebook today? Did you Google anything today? I'm sure everyone has. Or the, the uh, Trump card for everything. Did you send or receive a text message today? If so, did any of these work? Did you pick up any malware on your text message? Well, why or why not? So the simple answer there, Juniper platforms are running and securing all of these networks and many others. So the message that I would have for, for everyone out there is, you're using Juniper every day. In fact, you're connected to this webinar, uh, you're going through an ISP, so chances are you're going through a lot of Juniper routers there as well. So if nothing else, um, please Google a few more things today. Please check your Facebook. Please send and receive some tech me text messages because all of that creates more demand for Juniper within these major providers. But the uh, more salient or more relevant thing for you folks is since you use Juniper every day, you know that it works. 
And if we can handle networks along the scale of Google, we should be able to help you at, you, um, at your particular uh, facility or enterprise or school or, or GovEd organization. We would just scale down the exact same features, uh, the exact same redundancy and reliability, but we would right size it for your particular organization. And our, um, our new bragging rights slide. And uh, yes, you're gonna see this at the end as we wrap up the presentation too, just to, uh, to remind you. Um, the latest Magic Quadrant came out. A lot of customers have told us that when they're, they're doing a network refresh or they're planning some sort of expansion, they go to the Magic Quadrant and they really only uh, invite vendors who are, pretty, are highly ranked on the Magic Quadrant to the dance. So when it comes to wired and wireless LANs, Juniper is about as high as you could possibly go on the Magic Quadrant. Um, yes, this will be the focus of uh, many demand generation campaigns over the next couple months, trying to get the word out, but it's not an accident that we get there. In fact, it's very, very challenging to get there. Uh, Gartner does their homework, there is no doubt about that. They don't just look at the vendors and look at the products, they actually look at customers. And unless they can get a certain number of customer uh, testimonials, you're disqualified from the whole process. So this is a really cool place to have a dot on a chart. Um, but the reason it's there is because a lot of work went into the products, um, the installations, the designs, and had customer sat in general. Okay, that would be my uh, five minute overview of, or intro of Juniper. So let's talk a little bit about engineering simplicity. Our assumption is it doesn't really matter to your users that you have the latest switches in a network or the coolest routers or even the, uh, the, the most features. All of that's totally transparent to the user. Uh, an analogy that's probably overused in our industry is the electrical grid. When you flip that, that switch, you expect light to show up. Uh, you really don't know what's going on with transformers, with power stations, hydroelectric, and all that behind the scenes. You just want it to be that easy to use, and you want it to be there um, 7 by 24. So that's our view of networking as well. We want to focus on not necessarily better networks, but making networking better in terms of an experience for our clients. So times are changing, and uh, I, I, you know, we've all heard many, many sarcastic comments about 2020. There will never, I hope, be another 2020. But in addition to all of the challenges that it's brought, there also are a lot of interesting opportunities that are worth looking at. First of all, the network has become absolutely business critical. So this requires incredible predict predictability with regards to availability and performance. It requires more reliability, and it requires that all of these things have to be measured with analytics as well. Um, along those lines, the fact that the network is up does not mean that the network is good. And just as a little side, side note here, um, think about your own experiences. What pisses you off more? The fact that there is no Wi-Fi a in a place or the fact that they have crappy Wi-Fi? Uh, for me, it's almost always the latter. If there is no Wi-Fi, I understand, and I do a workaround with my phone as a hotspot. But if it's crappy Wi-Fi and it just keeps slowing down my uh, my work activities, that I find that to be really annoying. So that's the user experience side. Automation plays very heavily into this. Machines should configure machines. No, that does not mean that we're um, making network operations teams redundant but it does mean that we're adding simplicity and accuracy to the overall configuration and management practice. And finally, all of this has to be relevant. Um, the fact that Juniper comes out with a whole new protocol or a whole new chip chipset really doesn't mean a whole lot to any user unless it implements their, or unless it, it impacts their particular business, hopefully in a positive way. So this has to integrate with IoT. It has to integrate with medical systems. It has to be open with standards so that our users can actually take advantage of whatever the cool new feature set is of the day. 
So key trends, wired and wireless devices are soaring at the network edge. And um, probably in the COVID era, the best places to look for this would be medical and healthcare. Uh, it would be universities, which are trying to find ways to get students back to, to the campus and butts and seats. And it would also be for some of our very large cloud providers. Um, companies like Amazon Web Services, they, uh, they're, they're Usage is exploding in 2020 since uh, nobody's going into the office and actually using or expanding the servers there. So they also really need the reliability, the flexibility, and the automation that's tied to all of this. So what's making it all work as an overlay? Once again, we come to the artificial intelligence AI word. A little bit of a rhetorical question. Where does AI make a, the most difference? And the choices there are data center, versus campus and branch? Well, the data center you would think would be the answer because that's where the heart of the organization is from a compute standpoint. That's where you see those rows and rows and rows of servers. But the, uh, the odd thing there is that's a very controlled environment. You don't often have intruders there. You don't often have rogue equipment in the data center. Instead, you have consistency, you have consistent workloads, you have known connectivity, and it's actually a pretty stable uh, stable environment as well. Where things change a lot and are much more dynamic are the campuses and the branches. Uh, users walk in with weird devices all the time. Uh, bad actors absolutely know that and they try it too. Uh, you have all kinds of diversity and with regards to connectivity and hybrids. And you actually have, that's where the users reside. So that's where they're measuring their service level experience. They may not quantify it, it may be totally subjective, such as this network sucks, but that's really where AI can make the difference. And when we talk about this from an enterprise standpoint, we're really looking at the whole enterprise. So what you see here is a continuum and the x-axis really should be time for all of this. So it started from a Juniper standpoint with the deployment of wireless with our acquisition of MIST that was quickly added, or that uh, wired networks is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Ethernet switching was quickly added into the picture as well. So now you have AI-driven connectivity for both wired and wireless. And wired is going to be our talk for the rest of the, uh, the morning here. Uh, we're announcing SD-WAN additions in a couple months, so stand by for that. And then we look at the data centers as well. The reason data centers were prioritized last were the reasons we just covered in the previous slide. Um, they really have the much more stable environment and not so great of a need for AI, although we are co uh, collecting a lot of analytics and metrics from data centers. And then finally, we extend all of this to the cloud as well, at which point your customers or your enterprise has an entire common AI-driven network. And uh, just kind of a bragging rights slide here. Some of the logos that are work we're working with for this, these are real implementations. Um, nine out of the 10, Forbes 10, already use this technology. Some of the metrics that we've gotten from our customers, 75% uh, of help desk tickets are resolved on their own, automatically, all behind the scenes, because we use AI and we use automation. Um, ServiceNow, trumps that pretty significantly and says there's a 98% reduction in end user trouble tickets, down from hundreds a month to just a couple per month. Uh, the gap said there's a 97% of improvement with regards to accuracy in all of the deployments. And you can read some of the other stats at your, at your leisure, but these are things that we can talk to you guys about in more detail. And between Juniper and uh, Securematix, if a reference is needed along these lines, we can help with that too. Okay, let's uh, look at the campus network now. And while we do that, there really are four topics that I want to go over. Uh, user experience, simplifying operations, campus fabrics, and then eventually getting to what the products are as well. Um, let me pause for just a moment. Bailey, were there any questions or comments that came up? Well, not yet. Okay, good. Um, 
Or if you guys have a good joke, make Bailey's day and send it to her too, please. So starting with user experience. So here's an interesting question for you guys. Think about your network operations center. Can you detect and fix issues before users notice? I would say that there definitely are some that you could probably address. You could uh, anticipate that a new big project is starting in the Denver office, so that's going to require additional bandwidth, and maybe dynamically you want to set some allocations. Um, or maybe a new project is, is project group is coming together, and that either creates or some new security challenges, or perhaps they need special access around security uh, policies. So you can anticipate some of that, but if a router is overheating, if a cable is, is a bit flaky, if you have a loop in the network, you know how we usually find out about those? Somebody calls and complains to the help desk. Sure would be nice if you knew as a network administrator before that call came in and you could fix the issue and take care of the user before they even knew there was a problem. Well, that actually happens. And that was part of Dartmouth's comment with regards to 75% of the issues are fixed before they even know that an issue exists. So challenges facing the uh, wired and wireless networking community, or sim more simply said, campus area networks. First of all, complexity. Devices are soaring. Um, if you do buy best of breed, there's nothing wrong with that concept, but you do get a very, very mixed network and then management does become a bit of a challenge. I, I'm still a fan of best of breed, but also be aware that there are some trade-offs associated with that in terms of complexity. Um, existing solutions are for management, not overall operational efficiency. So what we want, once again, are happy users, not just knowing that we can ping the Denver office. Um, wired and wireless networks typically lack AI assistance, and that would be the non-Juniper world they're talking about. And monolithic systems tend to lack agility. Uh, the environment today is very, very dynamic for lots of reasons. So agility and being able to adapt when the new project comes up or when there's a new acquisition is absolutely critical. And then you should be able to automate all of this too so that you can anticipate the issues or the needs and react before anybody even voices those issues. So unifying the wired and the wireless world, we're going to use APIs for that. Oops, sorry, I skipped ahead there on by accident. But we wanted to deliver SLEs. So instead of service level agreements, we want to meet service level expectations. And that's getting a little more subjective. That's the, the user saying wireless sucks or your network is horrible. I don't think they can quantify that very accurately on a scale of one to 10. That's going to be more their gut feeling, but we want to be able to, to uh, resolve that issue with them. And one way to do that again, automation. So Juniper offers APIs for all of our devices, and it's very easy to write to those to monitor um, a particular performance level or a particular user individually as well. Uh, maybe you do want to put flags on anybody on the C staff just to make sure that they're always getting the response that they expect. How do you look at these? Service level expert expectations? Well, very, very simply. Uh, the, your dashboard gives you all of these charts. You don't need to buy a separate management system by any means. Uh, this is with the same dashboard you probably used to deploy the devices. So you can look at the throughput of an individual switch. You can look at the throughput of an individual port. You can look at the throughput of an individual user session. So if I want to know um, what applications Bill is looking at, what is his response times are, and what his throughput is, and if there are any problems, I see all of that from the dashboard right in front of me. And yes, there are red, yellow, and green alarms tied to that as well. <clears throat> so AI as a foundation for this is again a bit of a journey or a continuum. Uh, it started with data. If you don't have data, you having all the AI in the world won't help you in the least. So we are constantly collecting data from our customers. Uh, we do not tie this, we do not make it visible to anyone else. We just use it in the back end. What we collect are analytics. We are not tracking any sessions. 
which hopefully they're encrypting anyhow. We do not collect user data. We collect analytics and up to 150 of those per user session. Um, and we actually uh, allow you to use a configurable timer for all of that. We typically recommend every 30 seconds to collect all of that information. So once we have that data, we can use some AI primitives and event timelines. So we can see that if the Denver office has a problem every Thursday at 10, 10 a.m., uh, let's take a look at what's going on there. Let's drill down a bit. Oh, that's when they run their wide, their staff meetings and they have a, a company-wide video. Now we understand, now it makes sense. So we're gonna allo allocate more bandwidth, or perhaps we're going to slow down some of the other applications for that particular moment in time. With that, we have a data science toolkit. So that's kind of the uh, buzzword that accompanies AI these days, it's data science. But let, that lets us say we have these 150 metrics for each and every connection. Let's take a look at what really matters out of those. Um, that 150 surely doesn't matter. The same, the same variables and that surely don't matter to each and every user. Instead, let's customize that and let's focus our, our analytics on their particular situation. We have a conversational interface into that. We call it Marvis. And um, if any of you are Tony Stark fans, I'm kind of afraid that he might sue us for this, but it hasn't happened yet. So Marvis is our automated assistant. You can ask Marvis what's going on in the Denver office, or you can ask Marvis, why can't Bill connect to the uh, engineering PC or the engineering servers? And you'll get a response back based upon the data, the AI primitives and the toolbox. And finally, the win for all of our customers is a self-driving network. Networks that correct themselves, deploy themselves, and um, no operator intervention necessary. This saves time, but more importantly, it's also more accurate than us feeble little human units. So just a few comments on the virtual network assistant. You, uh, oh, the, the writing is way too small on that. I really apologize. Um, it's a conversational natural language interface for that. So in this case, what we've asked Marvis to do is to troubleshoot a particular user named, uh, what does that look like, Mist P116. I have no idea who that is, but it's uh, something significant to the network administrator of that particular organization. Marvis comes back with several different, different in interpretations. Uh, first of all, there were several problems with that user. Based upon those problems, what we recommend is, um, let's see, uh, delete a VLAN perhaps, or in fact, reconfigure and upgrade their code. All of those are valid recommendations in order to solve P116's problems. Uh, you can have Marvis do that for you. So that's the self-driving part. Um, most of our customers, even including Dartmouth today, which gave us that glowing recommendation, prefer to have Marvis recommend something to a human, then the human can go correct the action. Uh, that's just developing a level of trust with automation and with Marvis. Um, once you see that Marvis is right more, most of the time, in fact, the vast majority of the time, let him take the actions as well. And that's identifying and correcting a problem, no user intervention, intervention necessary. Uh, some of the things that Marvis tracks across root cause, uh, firmware upgrades, we can push those out to all of the switches in your network. Authentication issues, it can create RMAs when there's a failure. If a power supply crashes on one of your switches, um, the user won't even know that you've sent an RMA in, hopefully, until you get it and replace the device. It can track configuration errors, it can find loops, can identify um, layer one issues as well, such as bad cables to your switches. And one stop takes care of all of it. And Marvis says, I can show you some more if you want. So all of that leads to simplified operations. So <laughs> a message to the network ops people out there. Don't even think about logging into a box. That CLI stuff was so 1990s. Uh, we're moving ahead very quickly with that, with letting machines configure machines. So if you're setting up a new greenfield device in your network, day zero, provision it. That means single click act activation, 
uh, plug plug the device into the wall, adopt it into your your um, in, into your network operations interface, which we would call the MIST AI interface, and then let the network itself push out the latest version of code. Let the network itself configure the device. Uh, let the network recognize the ports for whatever they are, uh, whether you plugged in a VoIP phone or another switch or an access point, and then push the appropriate config to that port. And by the way, that can be dynamic. So if you swap ports for something, you're still push the right information and right config. And then for operations, let's monitor and troubleshoot all automatically. And this works for Greenfield, as, or this works for Greenfield uh, very nicely because every Juniper switch that you receive includes an activation code in the form of a, a QR on the box itself. You take your phone, you scan that QR code, and the switch is automatically adopted into your system. All of the auto deployment things kick in. If it's Brownfield, if it's an existing switch, uh, we give you a little bit of a code template to add to it. Uh, that's about six lines. And then that, after that, the switch is adopted and it's managed by the, uh, by the MIST AI interface as well. I mentioned the profile, so not much more to say about that other than we can identify the port based upon what's plugged into it. Or you can in fact manually say ports nine through 22 on the switch go to engineering servers. Um, when things move, the configuration moves with them. So auto provisioning could take place on a port basis, on a port group basis, on a switch basis, on a switch group basis, or on an entire network basis. And um, yes, we could make a great case for why your new network should use all Juniper switches. Uh, somebody told me the other day that there are other vendors out there. I was really shocked and dis disappointed to, to hear that. But the good news is we can actually track and manage uh, those switches as well. We cannot push the configs out. We cannot push the new firmware out. But we can, in fact, monitor their compliance with the service level experience that your customers want. So wrapping that up, what that gives you is good user experience. It gives you AI-driven operations. Uh, it automates the network and gives you a full stack portfolio that can today look at the Wi-Fi and the LAN stand by for uh, for the wide area and the um, and the security introductions too. Hey Bill, do you have a yes, question? Come in. Um, which dimensions of data traffic can you throttle? Example: bandwidth, throughput, video resolutions, etc. Oh, great question. Uh, the answer is actually yes. So the way we do the way we would throttle is with a um, with with quality of service or classes of service, basically. So you can identify that class of service. And let's just keep it simple. We give you eight different classes, but let's just say the old proverbial gold, silver, bronze example. Um, you can identify users or applications or locations, whatever you want, and fit them into one of those particular classes. So CEOs probably would always be gold. Uh, web surfing and uh, email perhaps would be bronze. And then you can, you can quantify the other applications or the users or the sites based upon whatever your organization's objectives are. And you can also change that dynamically too. So I think my example that I used earlier was that a uh, video conference is conducted periodically at the uh, same day and same time every week. So maybe dynamically you want to upgrade the video conference bandwidth for that particular time. Then after all said and done, send it back to normal. Okay, other questions? Thanks, no more at this time. Okay, so now the fabrics themselves. So this is the underlay. This is, um, this is what's going on behind the curtain. So your campus architecture, first of all, I would say, and I'm very passionate about this, really, really, really needs to be open and standards-based. I um, heard somebody once say uh, that the nice thing about standards in our industry is that there are so many of them. Um, I don't think I quite agree with that, but I think there are some that are very dominant in the campus area environment. So these, uh, in terms of routing protocols, OSPF and BGP definitely come to mind. 
Um, I'm kind of anti-spanning tree, but it is a standard and Juniper does follow that too. If, our, if our products are standards based and if brand X, Y, or Z are standards based, they should at least in principle interoperate. Uh, let's say your mileage may vary. Please test things in your lab. Please work with uh, with Juniper or Secure Maddox to validate. But if it's standards based, uh, there's probably a pretty high probability of success there. More importantly, if it's standards based, this gives you as a user a lot of flexibility going forward. So if you do want to introduce other items into your network, uh, perhaps things that Juniper doesn't make, such as uh, endpoints or IoT or anything else. Again, keep them standards based. That'll make your life a whole lot simpler. End of lecture there. What our customers tell us in addition to that that they want for campus fabrics, first and foremost, flexibility and choice. They want to be able to pick whatever type device is most appropriate for their users or their applications or their needs. And they want to be able to have some agility and flexibility because those needs change quite frequently as well. Uh, always up, high availability, absolutely, that's a given. Um, a lot of that's accomplished with regards to redundancy. So if you look at this from a network standpoint, you can get very, very high availability uh, by having uh, multiple paths and multiple devices that you can go through. Um, on a simpler level with regards to just single devices, um, you might wanna look at the MTUs before you make a purchase or um, mean time between failure, MTBFs rather. Uh, you might also want to look at whether or not there's redundancy with the active components. So the active components are what are likely to fail the most in any kind of uh, electronic device. And those are frankly, the fans and the CPUs, the lowest tech parts of those devices. So you may want redundancy on those as well. And then there's performance for scalability. Um, don't build your network for today, build it for tomorrow. And in order to do so, you probably have to look at some of the long-term requirements and add in the scalability needed to get you there. Campus architectures. This is a place where your resellers or um, Secure Maddox or Juniper can help you with, with regards to coming up with the best solution for small to medium campuses on the left or large hand headquarters campuses with the other two diagrams there. You'll notice these diagrams are actually rather similar to each other. You have distribution switches, which we're combining into what we call a virtual chassis, more on that in two slides, but those are the ones that are talking to the end users. And they're probably doing it through, um, through Wi-Fi, or those could be your switches in the server room as well, talking to the servers as endpoints. On top of that, you then collapse the switches into other switches. So these would be the core switches or the distribution switches, depending upon which logo you're following or which lingo you're following there. These are actually switches of switches. So these are where you really need the high performance and also the, uh, the high reliability. In a small to medium campus, those could be just mid-sized switches like you see. In a much larger organization, those could be bigger, more robust switches, and they could be tied together in some sort of a fabric. There really are two choices for fabrics, and you see those in the uh, center and the right-hand diagram. The fabrics could either be layer two based, meaning they're switch-based fabric. So what that does for your user is it allows them to extend VLANs across the campus, um, such that if you're going to add some more servers to the engineering VLAN, they can be pretty much anywhere, but they'll still be in the same VLAN as the servers, although not directly connected. Or they could be layer three based, which is a picture on the far right. So the difference there is these are IP subnets to segment the network and to tie it together. So you're tying the network together there with a routing protocol such as OSPF or BGP being the most common ones. Um, this lets you segment for performance each of the individual parts of the network. So you would have a different subnet for the engineering servers, different subnet for the HR servers, a different subnet maybe for remote, remote users. This, a lot of network administrators feels this gives them much more control and this makes their network a little more understandable than a just extending VLANs everywhere. Um, 
it's really a six of one, half a dozen of the other answer. Whatever is appropriate for that particular organization is something that we can support. The interesting thing here, though, is that the exact same switches are in all three of these diagrams. You may scale them up a bit with a few more ports, which may require additional power um, or faster interfaces, but really we're using the exact same concept, the same operating system. So when people ask Juniper if they sell a layer two or layer three switches, the answer is always yes. Switching and routing is inherent to all of these devices. And you could migrate from one to another because your toolkit gives you all of the above. So if you do want to build a new campus and push some of the existing switches out to the edge, all of that's very easy to do. And by the way, you can automate it through the, uh, through the management interface as well. Uh, when you look at branches, they tend to be much simpler. They tend to be smaller and simpler. So at the, at the uh, simplest level on the far left, a branch could be just a simple SRX interface with an AP. Uh, that SRX would give the user switching, routing, and security, and it could power the AP as well, and it could all be managed through a common interface. Um, the, the perfect example for this would be maybe a small bank or a small retail outlet um, or perhaps an insurance company that has, for example, farmer's insurance with branches in every city. If the branch grows a little bit, you might want to add a switch to talk to more users, and you might need more APs. Uh, if the branch grows a bit more beyond that, you may need a series of switches, which again, you can tie together in a into a virtual chassis. And then you also have the ability to double up on your WAN devices for reliability. You probably want to dual home those, and you can get a much more redundant network at the branch as well. Juniper uses a term virtual chassis. Uh, we do not use the term stackable. Um, honestly, the, what we're talking about really are stackables, but don't tell anyone. So what we say with these is we can combine up to 10 switches into one logical entity. So we look at this stack, if you will, of 10 switches as just one unit for management purposes. Uh, you only have to push the, the new upgrade or the new Junos code to one switch instead of 10. That's very significant for large organizations. Uh, when Juniper comes out with a new release of software, which we do twice a year, um, I don't ever advocate upgrading for the point of upgrade for the pro just purpose of upgrading. But if you need some of those new cool new features, you are going to want to upgrade. Um, let's just make up some numbers here. Let's say that there are 300 switches in your network. A typical Junos upgrade for a switch. Oh, takes up to maybe 20 minutes, worst case. So 20 minutes times 300 switches, um, that's a long time. That's a very long night for your uh, operations teams. However, if we use a 10 to one rule and we combine those 300 switches into 30 virtual chassis, now you're upgrading 30 units, 20, 20 minutes per pop. That's a much more tolerable evening for your operations team than 300. Virtual chassis don't need to be a typical stack. Whenever people talk about stackables, I picture a pile of switches. Uh, with virtual chassis, these could be extended over up to over 80 kilometers uh, for a metro network or between parts of a campus. So with 10 switches still as your, as your limit, you can in fact interconnect these very creatively between buildings or even, like I said, uh, between two different complexes. The typical rule of thumb for a virtual chassis or stackables, as our, our competitors call them, is that like switches talk to like switches. So from Juniper's standpoint, uh, EX4300s talk to EX4300s in a virtual chassis. However, we've actually added some upgrades to that as well. Um, this is a case where we'd have to help you with your your specific requirements, because this isn't uh, isn't across the board, but we do have ways to mix and match switches of some types into some virtual chassis. The place where we see this most commonly used is where, um, or the use case that's most common for this, is when the customer has both a lot of one gig and 10 gig interfaces, or even 25 gig interfaces. 
So you would expect that one gig switch switches tend to have a lower price point than 10 gig or 25. So they like to dedicate one gig switches to one gig users, as opposed to um, just using one gig ports on a 10 or 25 gig switch. But the fact that we can mix and match into a, a common virtual chassis, again, simplifies the management. And finally, you can use virtual chassis across the different tiers of the network. And we kind of saw that in the previous network architecture slides. I didn't really point it out though, but you can use virtual chassis at the bottom on the access layer, in the middle for aggregation, or perhaps for data centers, and also at the top core layer of the network. Okay, we're kind of winding down a bit here. So simplified portfolio. Uh, from access to core to edge, choosing the campus platforms should be as easy as ordering a pizza. Clever, clever analogy there. But what the users want along those lines, first of all, they want simplicity. They want an end-to-end -end solution that's easy to manage and that has all of the features that they need. Um, you, if, if a customer asks, does a Juniper switch support quality of service? Just to go back to the previous question. Uh, the answer, no matter what the switch is, is always going to be yes, and it's always going to be uh, with eight different speeds or eight different um, levels per port. And that's built into the hardware, and that's built into Junos to activate that. Speed and performance. Uh, pick your favorite number from the whole list there, whether it's one gig, uh, two and a half gig for your access points, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. We've got switches that cover all of those and they need to be cloud grade. Or I think um, the, the, the way that used to be said or service provider grade. So in other words, you want those five or six nines reliability. Um, when you look at those, you're talking six, five nines, I think gives you about 30 minutes of downtime per year. Six nines gives you about 30 seconds of downtime per year. Um, if you design the network properly, you can get around those, change, those issues too. Juniper's portfolio, at the top, we would have management, and that's what we've been talking about quite a bit here with the AI-driven enterprise. That enterprise can, in fact, extend to the cloud as well. Connected security, so security should be pervasive for all of this. This isn't really a security topic or talk. That's actually going to be the topic next month. But the point that we like to make for security is that all of your network elements, be them switches, routers, APs or firewalls can participate in securing the network as well. So that's why we see security as covered, covering things end to end. And then the actual Juniper portfolio, that includes the Wi-Fi, the switching, the routing, and the security. Uh, from an AI-driven enterprise story, what we have today certainly are the Wi-Fi, um, the, the Wi-Fi APs. It also includes our enterprise switches. Enterprise switches are easy to identify in Juniper's lingo because they begin with an E for enterprise. And coming very soon, the SRX is too for WAN connectivity. The enterprise switches look something like this. <clears throat> At the access layer, we have some of our single rack unit pizza box switches, if you will. Uh, the EX2300C, that's the smallest one here. <clears throat> Excuse me that's actually at the top of the stack on the uh, lower left, is desktop size. It has no fans, so it's completely silent. And it actually includes a magnetic mount, mount, mount rack too. So you can actually just stick this on the side of a, of a magnetic rack if you're so inclined. So that's what you would typically find in a shoe store or a small branch office. But all of these goes from small to large. Uh, let us help you, let Juniper or Securematics help you right size, the correct solution for your needs. Speeds and feeds, um, I don't want to belabor anything on this slide. All I want to say is that all of our switches are totally non-blocking, so they will never create a bottleneck, no matter what speeds you use, whether it's just a few gigabit links or even 100 gig for that matter. All of them are layer two and layer three switches, so you'll never have a question as to which features are on which switch the answer will just be yes, um, hence my QoS or COS example a little bit earlier. And all of our gigabit switches 
So that's 23, anything that begins with a two, three, or four are also covered by our lifetime warranty. And our lifetime warranty is just a little bit different than our competitors because it includes a few extra things. <clears throat> First of all, it includes 90 days of JTAC support. So that's being able to call in and saying, I'm getting OSPF errors. Uh, what, should, what configuration parameter should I tweak? It also includes advanced shipment for the switches, next business day shipment. So that means that you call JTAC, you say there's a power supply problem. We put a replacement switch in the mail, FedEx, uh, within the next day. Our competitors, on the other hand, have you send them back the switch, and then they have 30 days to help you out after that. So we ship the switch, we take you at your word, and we give you 30 days to return the dead, dead soldier back to Juniper. And we also include software. So software upgrades are included in the extended lifetime warrant or in the le lifetime warranty, as well as hardware. And that's also a big differentiator versus our competitors. Okay, wrapping up. Told you you're gonna have to see this one more time. We're really proud of this. Um, Juniper, Juniper had quite a fight to get to the position we're in. Uh, we were challenged many times by Gartner, and right now we have a, we, we have a great place for some bragging rights. So if, if, you're a, if you're a reseller, let us share this story with your customer. If you're a customer, I would suggest getting yourself a complimentary, complimentary copy of the Gartner report and seeing why they've ranked all of these organizations where they have. There's also a lot more resources for you folks on our website. Uh, the most important one, I think, are we have Wednesday demos. Wednesday at noon Pacific time, every week, we give an actual live demo of our wired and wireless uh, uh, networking capabilities. And that's your chance for Q&A as well. Hey, Juniper, how do you do such and such? You're totally welcome to forward those exact same questions to, to Securematics or to myself. But this is also a good chance to learn from others and see what their, their questions and concerns may be. Lots of white papers, including architecture, and lots of design guides are available to help as well. And all of these are pretty simple to find on, on the uh, juniper.net website. So with that, thank you very much for your attention this morning. Uh, let's open this up for any Q&A. No Nothing questions new? yet, Bill. Okay. Well, in that case, um, let me thank you, folks. Happy Friday to all. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Please watch for an announcement for the uh, for the next session that'll come out uh, that'll cover security. Thanks, Bill. Okay, everybody have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.